We are now live and I would like to welcome everybody who's dialing in right now we have 148 people dialed in already and uh, this was a massively popular event and we're very excited we had more, a record number of registrants today so uh, we had over 400. We hope that they are all able to join, but even if they don't, it looks like we're going to have a significantly bigger audience than usual. So it's going to be a very good conversation. So hi, everybody. My name is A.D. Simone, and welcome to our event, How to Desegregate Connecticut, How Desegregate Connecticut Would Impact Greenwich. Uh, I am a board member with the League of Women Voters here in Greenwich and co-chair of the Communications Committee. Uh, today's event is going to be a webinar and it will be a discussion followed by moderated audience Q&A. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, which means that the audience will be in view only mode. I know that you all know this, but I like to make sure that everybody is clear on how it's going to work. So just give me one minute and I'll give you the overview. Uh, the event will start with the panelist presentation for the first 30 minutes, followed by audience Q&A, and then we'll open it up to the live Q&A questions from the floor, from the audience. Feel free to enter those questions by entering uh, the Q&A at the bottom right hand side of your zoom screen and you can enter and type in the questions at any time we'll be looking at those on a first in first out basis and uh, our colleagues nancy duffy and jennifer dayton will be moderating the q a session in its entirety we will begin with the questions that were submitted at the point of registration as a priority followed by leaving maybe 10 to 20 minutes for audience q a uh, we have uh, as i said a lot of interest in this topic so we do expect that the q a will be very well uh, submitted on on the q a window this afternoon uh, if we don't get to you we apologize but we will do our best League board members will, will um, manage this, as I said, through the Q&A chat window, but we will not be using the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. So please don't, don't um, try to get your question asked that way. Uh, <laughs> a reminder, we, we are recording this event and it will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel uh, this evening, definitely by tomorrow morning. And uh, we'd like, would love for you to share that with your friends and colleagues around the town who may not be able to dial in this afternoon. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Uh, we, the League of Greenwich, is on record in support of inclusive housing in Greenwich. This event is being presented purely for informational purposes under the auspices of our 501c3 educational fund entity. The League has no position on this legislative proposal. We want to be clear on that. We do not have a position on this. This is a discussion here today that we will retain and we will retain a neutral stance throughout the entire process. We just want to be very clear on that. Um, the purpose of today's event is to provide the community with information about the housing reforms under consideration, as well as the opportunity for all of you in our community to ask questions. So we ask everyone to engage with the panelists in a constructive and collegial way. Our goal is to illuminate and we would like to leave you all better informed at the end of this. So remember democracy works best when we engage in civil discourse. We always like to say that just to make clear that we're all on the same team here. So without further ado, I will turn it over to my fellow board member, Deidre Kamlani, who will introduce the panelists. Deidre, over to you. Thank you so much, Aya. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're really fortunate to have such an expert group of panelists with us today. We're going to talk about how the desegregate Connecticut proposals would impact Greenwich specifically, as well as share the proactive work that Greenwich is doing locally to expand affordable housing. I want to thank our event co-sponsors, the YWCA Greenwich and the Greenwich Association of Realtors. We're also pleased to welcome Mr. Hull and members of the Civics 400 class from Greenwich High School. Okay. It's wonderful to have you all engaged in this important issue. I wanted to start by briefly sharing something from our town's 2019 plan of conservation and development. As you know, the POCD is prepared with extensive citizen engagement and many of you here may have participated in that process. When assessing the town's strengths, near the top of the list was our inclusiveness, our tolerance and our diversity. On the other hand, one of our biggest challenges was seen as our lack of moderate and affordably priced housing. And a key objective of the plan was to remedy that. So there seems to be broad community agreement that we want to have a range of housing in our town. The question is, how do we get there? So our discussion today will offer you some different perspectives on that question from the state, county, and town levels. So looking at housing policy from the state and county perspective, we're pleased to welcome Sarah Bronin, 
and Melissa Kaplan Macy. Sarah is the founder and lead organizer of Desegregate Connecticut. She is an attorney, an architect, a professor, and policymaker with expertise in property, land use, historic preservation, and energy. Melissa is the Connecticut Director of the Regional Plan Association, where she focuses on expanding economic opportunity, improving infrastructure, and adapting to climate change. She's an expert in land use planning and community engagement. Looking at this issue from the Greenwich perspective, we're fortunate to have Margarita Albin, Katie DeLuca, and Tom Hegney. Margarita is the chair of the Greenwich Planning and Zoning Commission, where she served as a member since 2006. Prior to that, she was a corporate brand manager for over two decades. Katie is the director of the Greenwich Planning and Zoning Department. She joined the department in 2001 and served as deputy director before being appointed director in 2014. And Tom has been a partner in the law firm Hegney, Lennon and Slane since 1980, where he is an expert in land use law. So we're, we're pleased to welcome all our panelists today. And I'd now like to turn the floor over to Margarita who will set the stage for the discussion. Hi, everybody. You're about to listen to a, what we hope will be a very fact-based discussion on an important piece of legislation. The panelists may at times disagree on facts, but we hope that that actually enriches your learning experience. As you listen, there are three key points to bear in mind. First, Sarah Bronin has rendered an enormous service to our state by bringing the discussion about housing diversity and the need for greater affordability to the fore. Second, the town of Greenwich is committed to those goals. We may not agree on some of the approaches being proposed, but we absolutely recognize the need. We have zoning regulations in place that move us in the right direction. Some of those date back almost 40 years, but we have not met the objectives and we actively seek new and effective approaches. Third, Although we may not always be on the same page, Sarah Bronin has repeatedly demonstrated her commitment to input and revisions to her proposals to make them more effective across the state. Please keep those ideas in mind as we discuss this topic. It's shared goals and a commitment to hearing each other on how to reach them. And by the way, you're also gonna hear a little bit about history in the making as the legislature is talking about Sarah's bill probably still as we speak, they're also working on it. So it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank you so much, Margarita. I'm going to just take a second to share my screen. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me here today um, as a panelist to bring a regional perspective and uh, just to open it up a little bit with just um, some data. So it's kind of level set regional plan association, we did a housing needs assessment for Fairfield County um, that we released very recently. And so I'm just gonna go over a few highlights on um, data points that speak to Greenwich specifically as a way to frame the conversation that we're going to have today. Oh, sorry, next slide. Okay, so just a few quick stats. Um, just wanted to share on population and housing. So Greenwich, um, as I'm sure many folks in the audience know, population of around 62,000, which is an increase 1.4% um, since 2013. And how that measures up in terms of Fairfield County, sort of middle of the pack, um, with Stanford and West Ford at the high end, around 4%, and Trumbull um, having a slight population loss, 0.2% during that same period. And you can see just a few other stats there. 32% of your housing units are renter occupied, 29% multifamily and 34% of your households are housing cost burden. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so just on income and inequality, just to point out um, one stat there, rents or households make one third of what owner households make in the town of Greenwich. And black and Latinx households make less than half of white households in the town. In terms of housing types, 71.2% uh, single family, 28.8% uh, multifamily, and that's pretty typical for, um, for suburban communities. I'd say actually Greenwich does um, a little bit better than many suburban communities on multifamily. And in terms of owner occupancy, similarly, 60% um, owner occupied, you do have uh, about a third of units or rents are occupied in the town of Greenwich. And in terms of subsidized housing, um, again, relative to other suburban Fairfield County towns, you know, you do relatively well, um, 863 units altogether in federally subsidized housing, which is 3.65% of the total um, federally subsidized units in Fairfield County. 
And on the state subsidized side, uh, you have 646 units altogether, and that represents 6.05% of the Fairfield County total of state subsidized housing units. In terms of housing costs, um, over the last 20 years, housing costs have remained flat while incomes have fallen, so that makes housing less affordable overall. And you can see that the median housing cost in Greenwich is uh, $2,481, which uh, ranks you eight um, out of 23 Fairfield County towns. And what does that mean in terms of affordability and, and rent level? So you can see um, from this chart area, median income, that refers to the median income for the Fairfield County region. And you can see um, at the 100% and the, the median is $143,000 approximately per year, and that equates to an affordable monthly housing cost of $3,585. And then to give you a sense um, on the other end of the median income spectrum at 30%, so families earning $43,000 per year, in order for a unit to be affordable, the rent would have to be $1,075. And I think you know we all know that that would be really difficult to achieve um, in a town like Greenwich. And then just lastly, just wanted to share um, in terms of housing cost burden in, in the town. So housing cost burden is generally understood to be um, when households are spending 30% or more of their income on housing. And you can see that actually 7,625 households in the town of Greenwich are housing cost burdened. And um, within that number, 4,280 actually spend more than half of their income on housing. So a lot of neighbors, you know, really... Um, spending a lot more on housing than their income would suggest that they can afford. So just wanted to level set with a few facts there, and then I will turn it right over to, I believe Katie is next on the agenda. So let me stop sharing my screen and, and thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm just going to... It's a privilege to be amongst this group, so thank you so much. Um, my job in this presentation is to talk about our land use plan um, for the community and how affordable housing fits into that plan. And anytime we talked about this subject, we start with our plan of conservation and development, which Deirdre just mentioned. Our last one was approved in December, 2019. And not much has changed in terms of the overall construct of the town with respect to our zoning. We have three main categories, single family, multi-unit family, and commercial mixed use. And a lot of variability actually within, within each of those categories, which does add to our diverse housing stock. As uh, Margarita mentioned, that is something that we've paid attention to for, for close to, um, well, for over 40 years in some instances with our zoning regulations. Um, this is a, a map of the town that shows um, our land use pattern. Um, you can see that the, the predominant land use is single family. Um, however, within what, what's most striking about this map is that you can see that there's a lot going on and it's and even within those single family areas, there's very different colors representing some of the zoning um, options that people have taken advantage of that have led to things like multiple dwelling units on properties, whether they be accessory structures or just multiple dwellings because they have excess land. Um, the, green, the green blotches there show conservation subdivisions where we've allowed people to add extra units in exchange for um, additional land area being preserved. So it's, you can see we've got um, um, quite a diverse area um, of quite a diverse option and it's, it's really ubiquitous throughout the community. Um, the next speaker after me will be Sarah, and she's going to talk more about what's, what she's um, proposing. Um, and part of it is, uh, um, involves the train station. So I thought I would just narrow down on this area um, for the purpose of this discussion. That red blotch right there in, in the middle, if you can see my cursor there, that's the, the central Greenwich train station. Um, the green going out from there is a quarter mile radius from the train station. The yellow is a half mile and then the pink is one mile. Um, what I want you to note here is the red, red and white lines there indicate our sidewalks. Um, and then the other big circles are either housing authority, um, housing authority units or privately developed um, affordable housing units. Within that same area, here's our zoning. The green area shows the um, mixed use commercial zone. 
um, out from there is the um, two family and beyond that is the single family. And out of that zoning construct, you can see we have a tremendous amount of variability um, as shown by these different colored dots. Um, without getting into the specifics of it, because it's obviously a bit difficult to read the map, particularly in the short time here. Um, but, but the basic gist of it is 13% within this one mile radius is single family, 18% is two family, and 52% is multifamily. And you can see it, it pretty much follows the area of the um, uh, of the zoning, which is what you'd expect and what you'd hope for when you create zoning regulations, and um, it's within our walkable downtown area. So the overall question here is, is about diversity of housing and what we're doing, and it sounds like everything's hunky-dory based on what I've just, just, just shown you. So the big question then is, is what's missing? And as noted in our plan of conservation and development, that's affordable housing. Um, we do have four options within our zoning regulations to promote affordable housing. One is we call moderate income. It's our own language that we put together that's specific to our workforce that, that uses um, the average town employee salary as the basis for those units. Uh, we also have accessory apartments, which uses the 80% area medium income that you just heard Melissa refer to. Then we have a small unit zone and the planned housing design elderly zone. Um, example of that is actually Hill House. Um, then in addition to our local zoning, we also um, have developers use Section 830G of the general statutes. Within that, there's two definitions of affordable housing. One is assisted, where a unit counts if it is um, produced as a result of um, financial assistance from a government entity. The other is called set-aside development, and that's where you have deed-restricted units that are 30% um, of which have to be below market rate. <clears throat> I'm just cruising through these here a little bit because I know we're on a time crunch, but I did want to show you what it looks like in the community. This is uh, the new units that were just developed at um, Armstrong Court. I think they're a fantastic example of um, beautiful affordable housing, both inside and on the outside. And I think the Housing Authority, which is now called Greenwich Communities, has done an excellent job. Uh, also, our private developers, I think, should be commended for the job that they have done. On the upper right-hand corner there is Byram Shore Apartments. Those were our first 830G produced units. Um, some of those actually look out over Long Island Sound, so I think that's, that's pretty mm -hmm. awesome. Um, so what we've tried to do is we've tried to create um, a, um, within our below market rate um, either zoning regulations or through 830G. We have um, varying incomes that uh, would qualify for these units. These are slightly lower than the ones that Melissa showed you because they use the state um, the, the state medium income as opposed to the area medium income, which the way the statute is written, that's um, what we, we have to go with. Um, just quickly, I did ask the assessor to give me the land values of vacant land in, commun in the community. And the cheapest one for a 7,500 square foot lot um, was around 300,000. And the most ex uh, expensive just on average for an acre was around 5 million, just on the quick example there. I don't think I need to tell this group that land is expensive in the town of Greenwich, but I only just make the point when you look at where these um, incomes come in. So again, um, sounds like we, we've got a lot going on with our zoning and with our 830G. So what's, what's, what's happened to how, why are we still one of the 138 out of 169 towns that haven't met the 10% threshold set by the state? And that's 10% of our overall housing units. Um, we have 25,000 plus housing units. We're only at 5%. Um, if we used the set-aside development scheme of 830G to meet um, that demand, uh, we would need an additional 4,000 housing units because don't forget, 30% um, is, 30% um, uh, of the overall units have to be below market rate and those are the ones that count. Just to give you an idea, south of the post road um, in Old Greenwich, that's about 3,300 housing units. Um, I think what's a bigger concern is that all those units bring in about 10,000 more people if you consider two and a half people per unit. Um, and we've had our population steady at 60,000 as, as Melissa noted. So just two more slides. 
So the overall plan um, is a, quite extensive. It is a multi-pronged approach. Uh, it is very specific to Greenwich, recognizing our needs and what works in our community. Um, part of which is working within the state construct with what um, they call housing unit equivalency points, using this option, which allows the community to have a moratorium from 830G. Uh, we would need less units overall than the 4,000 I mentioned before. So that's something we're looking at. We have inclusionary zoning regulations, but we're in the middle of, or actually at the tail end of making adjustments to those now. We'll have those on the public hearing um, at one, the second April meeting, and that requires a certain number of below market rate units when you construct housing developments. Um, we also are very interested in creating a housing trust fund so that we can provide the gap financing to both Greenwich communities and to private developers to help them offset the high cost of land so that they can build affordable housing that works for the town. As I, I was very important, I wanted to show you those photos because it does work and it works beautifully in the community when it's done right. And we believe this housing trust fund and the ability to help developers do it right is the way to go. And we've had great feedback on it so far and you'll be hearing more about that as, as uh, we present um, further in, as we get further along with our housing trust fund language, we just kind of in those early days. So in conclusion, Greenwich has long promoted a diverse housing stock and it shows when you look at our housing, our housing um, diversity and also our land use plan with the success of the community, which is um, has many different things that go into that success that has driven up uh, land value, which makes creating affordable housing extremely challenging. Um, we do have a well thought out, but can always changing and always thinking approach to how we're going to increase that affordable housing stock to not only meet the state's requirements, legal requirements on our town, but also our own individual goals. Uh, we feel that the way to do that Generally speaking, um, just the main, the main, there's more involved in this, but just the main points are with inclusionary zoning regulations, our accessory apartment rules and um, gap financing with the key to all of that being our housing trust fund. So with that, I will say thank you so much for your time. And now I am very pleased to present or to move on to Sarah who will give her presentation. Thank you. Great, Katie, thank you so much. And as I pull up my screen, I just wanted to say thank you so much to the organizers of this event. Um, it is a really important conversation and I'm so glad and grateful to everybody who's who's joined from the public side. Um, so I'm Sarah Bronin. Uh, I'm a, uh, an architect and attorney uh, as noted, and I also chaired the city of Hartford's planning and zoning commission for seven years. So I have a lot of experience at the local level with planning and zoning. And I really appreciate uh, everything that, that Katie and Margarita have done uh, in Greenwich to try to move things forward. So I am going to just, uh, just a brief overview, you probably know this already, but I'm representing a, a pretty big coalition of about 66, I think, organizations um, that really believe that we have an opportunity right now to, to think in, in the first step, modest ways about how we might change our land use to address some pressing issues that I think we all recognize that we have in our society. I'll say a little bit more about our coalition, but again, it's a very broad, uh, very broad group. And again, just for framing purposes, we are looking at statewide legislation. We are not any of the groups that are working uh, in litigation against towns or anything like that. We've actually been working with, I have to fix my, my like mouse here, I'll just do it manually. Working with a, a lot of different, a uh, lot of different towns uh, to to come to our proposals, which I'll be talking about in a moment. There's a lot of reasons to act. I don't have time to go through them today. We do have a page on our website um, about all of these reasons: uh, equity, environment, and economy, really being the three big uh, buckets that we see. Um, but I did want to mention that one big reason uh, that we think it's time to to start thinking about uh, new options is that we think Connecticut has one size fits all zoning right now. Um, the pre predominant uh, zoning that we have in our state is single family housing on detached lots um, to the point where the purple represents everywhere that single family housing is allowed as of right. Um, and that's single family housing of any size. And you can see it's pretty much all of the state, 91% of the state. 
the environmental reasons are, are strong too, because that of that detached uh, single family housing, um, we end up producing sprawl, which exacerbates climate change, increases the amount of vehicles, uh, vehicle miles traveled and so on. So I just wanna say at the very beginning, what you'll see uh, in the proposals, which I'll turn to next, is really an overarching hope that we're trying to concentrate new housing where development already exists, uh, at least giving people the opportunity to choose that if that's uh, where the market demands it. So with that one minute introduction, just turning to our proposals. So you may have seen uh, a lot of these proposals in the news uh, and, and sometimes the, what has been said is not necessarily, um, uh, at least in, in my view, uh, accurate about either what's in the, the bill. So I have a bunch of screenshots in, in the bill as it stood at least this morning. Um, and, and then also uh, happy to provide uh, the Greenwich context as well. So what I'll be doing is in the context that you just heard about what Greenwich has been doing, kind of highlight how the proposals that we've put forward for this legislative session might uh, or might not impact Greenwich. The first one of uh, the proposals, and actually I'm gonna to turn to this slide first. So ignore the text, but look at the image. An accessory dwelling unit is a small unit of detached housing that is located on the same lot as a single family house. In Connecticut, and so here we are back with this purple again, the purple shows um, where accessory dwelling units are allowed at all in the state. Um, and the right shows where accessory dwelling units are allowed without uh, some restrictions. Um, that, that we've seen. And so these images come from our zoning atlas. That is a, a compilation of information about all zoning codes in the state. It's on our website and it's a great resource. Um, whether you uh, a, a agree with the proposals or not, it's help, certainly I think been very helpful for towns. Um, so we're proposing that accessory dwelling units be allowed as of right, um, that they be allowed up to 30% of the single family dwelling size, that they be allowed uh, both attached and detached um, and also to benefit towns, by, so we're, if legalizing accessory dwelling units hasn't been done in a particular town, um, it's, it would be a new thing. And hopefully people would produce accessory dwelling units. We would take ADUs out of the denominator for 830G, meaning it won't count against towns to produce these new units of housing, which we think will be naturally affordable and diversify the housing stock within existing communities. So just as a note, other than that mention, our proposals do not touch 830G or really have anything to do with large multifamily housing. So whatever you've heard about condos raining down from the sky and 100 unit buildings being permitted, that's not what our bill, uh, bill proposes. That's the only part that, that talks about 830G. Now I use the phrase as of right when talking about accessory dwelling units, um, as defined in the bill, as of right means able to be approved in accordance with the terms of zoning regulations. That means zoning regulations that the public has developed through a process in section 8-3 of the general statutes, which is not being touched by our proposals. So our thought is that um, by allowing administrative approval through Katie's office, for example, uh, in the case of Greenwich, it, the public could have the say in writing all the rules in advance um, but it would be a staff approval. And we think that would be, so here's the language that talks about public hearings when drafting zoning regulations. So we think that will be really helpful. Uh, again, this image just comes from our zoning atlas. Um, in Greenwich right now, accessory dwelling units are restricted to the elderly or deed restricted affordable, and, but they are allowed everywhere. And in fact, they're allowed as of right everywhere. They're allowed for non-family, uh, non-employees. Um, they're not restricted to the primary structure, which means they're allowed detached. So Greenwich is actually doing a pretty good job on accessory dwelling units. With SB 1024, it, the elderly only restriction would be lifted. And again, new ADUs would not be counted against Greenwich's 830G totals. Um, also explicit in the bill, uh, it says that towns can regulate ADUs for short-term short rentals. That means you can ban Airbnb. You can still require owner occupancy, which you do. And of course you can establish as a town architectural standards. The second proposal I wanted to talk about and I'm going quickly because I know we don't have tons, tons of time is Main Street housing. We call it middle housing. Um, it's between two and four units of housing around a Main Street. 
This proposal would not affect a town like Greenwich, and you'll see why in a moment. It really is geared toward the towns that don't have any provision for housing around their main street. Actually, Stonington does. I love this image of Water Street, uh, a pretty vibrant uh, street, shopping street, if you've ever been down there. Um, it allows for two to four family housing uh, in that very historic area and brings a lot of life to that local businesses. So this proposal would apply to towns over 7,500. It would, again, rest a lot of control within the local planning commission about uh, what type of middle housing, two, three, or four units, um, where it would be located within that main street area that the town selects. So which main street the town would select is within the, within the town's jurisdiction as well. Um, the, among our supporters, and here's why I say I'm coming back to this image of, of the of the group are Preservation Connecticut, the Connecticut Main Street Center, and AIA Connecticut, all of which are focused on the form of buildings and the form of communities, um, and of course, historic places. So we've developed the proposals in tandem with, with people who, like me, I just stepped down as chair of Preservation Connecticut, care about historic main streets and other places. Oh, Connecticut Preservation Accents in there too. So you might be asking, has Greenwich ever adopted regulations allowing as of right middle housing? And again, from our zoning atlas, and Katie's map pointed this out as well, you allow two family housing as of right across almost 5% of Greenwich already. And so you can see it's kind of a huge swath um, of, of two family housing that's allowed as of right, again, to Greenwich's credit. So in other words, just going back, you, you satisfy this because you, you could have picked West Putnam Avenue, uh, or you could have picked um, you know, really uh, any, a, any, a couple of different um, main street uh, as defined in the statute and satisfy it already with what you do. Okay, so next proposal, transit-oriented development. There's a lot that's been written about transit-oriented development. This is one of those proposals that concentrates the development where it already exists. Um, right now in the tri-state region, of course, Fairfield County included in that, there's a lot of low density zoning near transit where you have a lot of very large lots um, right next to train stations. Again, Greenwich doesn't have that and I'll get to that in a moment. Our transit-oriented development proposal is within a half mile of a train station, half of that area, excluding environmentally sensitive areas, would be uh, four units, uh, four units. That's sort of the, the maximum minimum. Um, the town could choose to have more than four units. Um, and if they choose to allow more than 10 units, 10% 10 of those units would have to be affordable. Actually, it says at least 10%. So again, here, you know, who helped us develop these proposals and reinforce what we were doing? The Sierra Club, Save the Sound, uh, Norwalk River Watershed Association. Many people on this call hopefully know of these great environmental organizations. And the idea is it, by allowing housing near these places where it's more likely to be walkable, like the Main Street proposal, you're more likely to do better for the environment than the current uh, Trust for Public Land as well, than the current zoning allows. It's American Society of Landscape Architects. So there's a lot of reasons for zoning around transit. Massachusetts just had a big uh, discussion about this and they nearly unanimously passed at the state legislature transit oriented development zoning. So I don't understand why it's been so controversial here, especially given the proposal is so limited with just four units, um, but that's hopefully we can get to that in Q and A. So again, at least four units, so four is fine. Um, the town does not have to permit anything more than four units. There has been a question about the phrase 15 units per acre, the intent of that phrase, it's still four units per lot, but a town who wanted to, let's say, skirt around these units, uh, this that requirement couldn't say, oh, it's four units per lot, but you need one unit per acre. So this just says for lots that already exist, it's four units, and then um, you can't have a huge requirement for each unit to have a certain number of acreage. So again, the town decides inclusionary requirements. If you wanted to say more than 10%, which I know Greenwich has, has been contemplating and, and you know that's fine. The town decides the height of buildings. It decides the form of buildings. So how many units, where the TOD is located, the architecture and the location within the radius. So again here, eyeballing uh, the 50% of land within the tra Greenwich train station. So, so it's just one train station, by the way, per town. Greenwich already allows, as of right, four family housing in the 50, what looks to me to be about 50% of that radius. Um, so again, the consequence of this for Greenwich is actually pretty minimal. 
Um, I, there is an interesting stat on the uh, just on the downtown because I'm familiar with Greenwich. Uh, my in-laws lived there for many years. The, the, the Greenwich downtown population has dropped pretty significantly, almost by half since 1960. So this would be really kind of going back to my point about preservationists being very interested in this, restoring that um, in, and helping to boost those numbers um, is, is always a good idea. But again, Greenwich already zones in a way that would do that. So what would change there? Potential for more par population uh, downtown and um, parking. So just last word on parking. Um, parking has been studied in, in very recent years to have many negative benefits and mi minimum negative problems. <laughs> minimum parking requirements in zoning have been tied to more driving, more pollution, and more uh, you know, and all of the the more uh, dirty stormwater runoff, respiratory disease, and so on. Um, so parking requirements, uh, at I, this may be right, and, and um, uh, uh, but I read an article uh, in one of your local papers that said parking had actually prohibited or hindered one um, the particular building from being developed. Um, you know, so but that, that's just one anecdotal story. But again, the idea is that sometimes minimum parking requirements get in the way. Um, so parking mandates that towns impose, our proposals would cap those at one per studio or one bedroom apartment, two uh, in two bedrooms or more. And our at least our first proposal is that around transit oriented uh, development in the main streets, there not be minimum parking. Although that I think uh, Margarita will, will address in her comments. So what would change in Greenwich right now in single family housing, you have zero minimum parking requirements for the most part, I think. Um, in two or more unit housing, you have in one zone with the elderly zone 0 0.33 units. Um, in other zones, you're actually, again, pretty close, 1.6 for studio apartments, uh, two, two parking spaces for two bedrooms. So the bill would not change your single family uh, parking or your two family parking. Um, it would probably change the parking mandates for one uh, uh, bedroom or studio apartments and limit that to one mandatory parking space, but a developer could build more. Okay, model form-based codes, I'll just say really quickly, this is something that the state would establish um, and as an offering to towns, towns could adopt it. Um, it's a way to, uh, to articulate this word character uh, through architecture. They would be completely optional, they would be free, Greenwich could completely ignore them and uh, you know, no harm done on the form-based code requirements. Um, so changes in Greenwich overall, maybe a few more ADUs, some parking requirements, commissioner training, but beyond these three things, I can't really see a lot else um, that changes in Greenwich. So with that, um, hopefully that uh, assuage some fears um, that have been going around and that this forum is so uh, great to, to address. Um, if you're interested in what we're doing, you can always visit our website or text zoning to 313131. Thank you so much. And I'm turning it over to Margarita. All right. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to cover, and Tom is going to help me. Tom Hegney uh, is just going to give the, the commentary on law. I'm going to cover three areas. What we would change about SB 1024. And I have in parenthesis that it's currently evolving because there is a new version out of the bill that addresses many of these concerns. What we really like and would keep, and then I have a huge laundry list at the end that I'm not actually going to discuss, but I did more because I told Sarah I have all these things in my mind that I want to tell you. So that's really for her. Uh, there are four provisions that, this, that we have concerns about as of right development with no public input. Uh, the theory behind this, I believe, is that commissions often listen to neighbors who are afraid of change and as a result that we don't move forward on affordable housing. I believe that public input is the foundation of the de democratic process. Sarah knows I feel very passionately about this and that we should continue having hearings on applications. I would note also for all of your benefit that the concern was that we might not, that we only stop and have hearings on multifamily applications. 
In Greenwich, we have public input when we get very large mansions because we believe that they have the same kind of impact on a community that a very large multifamily structure does. They are often similarly sized. Uh, you can fit four to six units in some of the mansions easily in the backcountry. We see those as being environmentally impactful and we like to weigh in on them. Uh, we have a concern about the locations for multifamily and middle housing being mandated. As Sarah pointed out, we already have locations where we allow them. We're not so clear that the train station will be the right place in the future, nor are we clear that we want to increase density along the post road. We would like to choose our own locations where there's really an opportunity for growth and diversity. The bill at this point, as Sarah pointed out, requires zero parking for multifamily dwellings. Sarah cites an example where we didn't do a multifamily, some sort of development because of parking requirements. Well, generally, um, this is, uh, it would be very hard to be doing, we have limited, I'm gonna go on to that and talk about why I have concerns. And finally, the, the bill only requires that developments over 10 units have an affordable requirement. So here are the four key issues again. The first one, as you would guess, is as of right development, no public hearings. We would suggest that the bill be revised to protect resident input on multifamily applications. The mandated locations for multifamily and middle housing. We believe towns should decide where development is most suitable. And it may not be around the primary train station or the main street corridor. Greenwich has very limited redevelopment opportunity. We're mainly built out. That means that when something comes in, it may not be in those neighborhoods and we may have an opportunity to do some multifamily and we should grab that instead. In addition, we're an old town and it isn't our sewer plant that is of limited capacity. It is our line capacity that goes to the sewer. We've had to turn down applications on at least one occasion because of not having enough line capacity in our sewer system. We're working on upgrade, grading it, but it's a long process. Uh, the other thing is, of course, flood zone constraints. We're very actively working on the resilient uh, coastal, on the coastal resiliency plan, and we are concerned about developing in flood zones. Our train station is, in fact, low lying, so it's a worry. Zero parking required for multifamily units. We believe it is imperative to provide some kind of parking. It doesn't have to be huge. Why? Because we're tight for parking in certain areas of our town. On the post road, we hardly have any parking and lower Greenwich Avenue for all those of you over 270, there's 279 of you listening. You all know that lower Greenwich Avenue, the area by the train station, you often can't find any place to park during the day. And finally, Affordable units are required only for a development that has 10 plus unit developments. We believe towns should have the freedom to decide their affordability requirements. Why? Because as presently written, Greenwich will gain more luxury units and lose our existing housing diversity. I'm gonna give you two clear examples on that. The first one is that no sooner did Sarah's bill come out then a developer contacted us and said that they were really excited that they're gonna build a nine unit luxury development. So they're gonna come right in under and it's gonna be luxury. And if that seems like a false threat, we actually shut down multifamily housing in one of our zones. Those of you who live in Greenwich, it's the Millbank Avenue area, because what we saw is that the multifamilies were taking away our middle and lower income homes and replacing them with high end luxury buildings with, by the way, not enough parking. So Millbank suddenly became parking constrained and full of luxury buildings where in the old days, it had multifamily houses, it had small houses. And so what we see is we have to manage multifamily development very carefully or we will lose our diversity. Sarah knows that I feel passionately about this. She's used to hearing from me. We've been talking for um, almost 10 months now, I think. Um, what we like very much about SB 24, the water conservation concepts. 
we've long wanted to have something in our regulations to offset massive water demand and reduction in the water table as we develop properties. The bill also Mark, provides- Can I just, can I inter if you just hit your arrow button to advance your slides, because yes. they're not advancing. Sorry oh, to mine. Oh, um, I did hit the I did hit the arrow button. Oh, okay. Do you guys not see? We only see the title page. Oh my goodness! And now? No, nope, still just the title page. Let me try this because I'm looking at the screen. Let me share again because I'm looking at the advanced version. How's that? Better. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. I don't know what that is, so I'll just have to keep doing that. Okay, but I already said all this, and then I was going to. And yeah, okay. Advanced. You're good. Okay, now that's weird. Right. Okay, yep. so back we go. Environmental provisions, renewable energy. Sarah has provisions for renewable energy sustainability. In addition, there's a restriction for clear cutting, massive tree removal in ridge ridgeline areas. We would have loved to have seen, and this is a B in, in our bonnet, more language on respecting, on being able to get people to respect local topography. As you all know, everybody takes a hilly community and makes it flat so that they can have a big, you know, big flat area, but it is very bad for the environment. The accessory dwelling units, as it is proposed in SB 24, they won't offer affordability anymore, but they will meet very important societal needs. Uh, aging in place, people with kids with disabilities, all sorts of reasons that somebody might, just raising some money, that people might want to have an accessory dwelling unit. We're a little concerned about the units that are outside of your house that are a separate building because of uh, what might have to happen for new construction and once again, flood zones. We worry a lot about flood zones down here. Old Greenwich is so prone to flooding that we always focus first on what happens there. Anybody from Old Greenwich that's listening, we do think about you. Um, there is a provision in the bill to better define the term character when we talk about our community. We think that a better definition strengthens the regulations. It makes us more accurate and specific in what we address. Uh, what the language that the bill uses is physical site characteristics and architectural context. However, we do believe that they should still be the basis for a denial for a full market price application. For a, an 830G application, of course, you would not consider character or context at all. You are required to only consider health and safety, basically, in the environment. But Full market priced applications should be respectful of their context. Uh, finally, and this is an update from the legislature, even if the section of SB 1024 that talks about commissioner training is not, if something happens to that bill and it doesn't go through, there was a commissioner training bill move forward at the out of, the, out of committee this morning. And we think that's fabulous. The better the commissioners are, the more they know, it facilitates our effectiveness. Uh, there's a little grumpy thing I have with that, which is that everybody has to report to the state all the time on whether or not they've taken training, and it's a huge and burdensome um, process. So those are the things we like, and I'm going to go backwards if that's okay. Um, that's okay. So there's the long list, Sarah, of things that now, can you guys see the four key issues? Yes. Okay. So um, there's a lot of confusion about this. Every time we talk about it, I'd like to make clear that it, the locations, I, let me just go back to the bill language as it stands right now. Oops. Okay, can everybody see key provisions of concern? Yes. 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 Okay, developments of at least four units each in at least 50% of the lot area within a half mile of the transit station. Um, I've talked to a lot of people about this. The language of the bill says developments of at least four units each, even though um, 
it could potentially be interpreted that the town would not have to require more than four units, would, would be able to stop it at four units. We believe that it's risky the way the bill is written, that we would be taken to court if there was a statute that said at least four units and we only allowed four. We would like the language to be very specific as to they don't have to be more, more than four units. And then here is at the bottom is the language on, on the affordability. It's any development that includes 10 or more residential units, at least 10% shall be affordable. But the trigger in the bill is at 10 units. So unless that language is just changed a little bit, we would be seeing the nine, the non, the luxury units that we're so worried would take away our, our diversity. And back we go to the four concerns we have. The last one you look at is to lose housing diversity. Uh, we've lost middle housing here. As the little houses come down and the luxuries come up. And Tom, do you want to chip in? I said I would ask you sooner, and I kind of rattled on. Go ahead. No, wanna... that's quite all right, Margarita. Uh, you know, uh, just to pick up on your point on at least four dwelling units, uh, six or eight is at least four. So you could have greater density, and if you're looking at at least 15 units per acre, uh, if you have a quarter acre lot, are you going to have at least four? Could you have six? And how does that jibe with the regulations that we have in terms of height, uh, FAR, setbacks, stories? Uh, does the, the proposed section six, which I understand has been currently removed from the, uh, the legislative proposal, uh, how does that jibe with the, the current zoning regulations? Does it override the zoning regulations we have in place now? Or uh, is, is it mod are they modified in some way? Uh, and and that, that's a, a primary concern. The other is that uh, we do have what I would describe as de facto uh, affordable housing in many of the areas in what are commonly referred to as the, the two family zone or the R6 zone, uh, which are in Byram and Chickahominy and Pemberwick and the center of town, as well as Costco. Uh, and if we were to have this type of regulation in the center of town, uh, much of that development that the commission was concerned about when it removed multifamily from the R6 zone uh, 10 years ago uh, would occur, and you're going to get much denser housing. However, you're going to have much less affordable housing uh, and much less diverse housing. Uh, so it, it, there's a bit of an irony there that you increase the, uh, the number of units and they may be a bit more affordable than the current luxury units that are being built. But going from $3 million a unit to $2 million a unit, I don't think is quite what we have in mind here. So, That's exactly right. Uh, so I, we, we need to see how we preserve those units that do provide affordable housing. Uh, and I have some other thoughts on that, which are for another discussion. Uh, but uh, how, how do we maintain that and take advantage of the fact that you are in the center of town, you are within walking distance of the train, you don't necessarily need a car. Uh, are there opportunities to do that, for example, in the CGBR zone uh, between the front and rear building lines on Greenwich Avenue? Where you that's Greenwich Avenue. That's code for Greenwich Avenue, people. <laughs> where you can actually provide greater density while giving people the opportunity to have the use of mass transit. So uh, uh, with some modifications, I, I think some of this could work, uh, but, uh, and I just wanted to touch on one other item, uh, the accessory apartments. Uh, that's some regulation we've had for a number of years. Uh, not, not all that different from what is proposed in section five uh, of the legislation, where it's 700 to 800 square feet a unit, proposing 1,000, we're 35% of- Oh, actually, we already went to 1,200. Uh, and uh, our regulation requires existing structures. This would allow for new construction. 
Um, and it's how you apply the, the, the building code to them. Uh, both would have uh, that application. So uh, that certainly is an opportunity to provide uh, affordable housing and additional units scattered throughout town, which really have no effect uh, on the overall neighborhoods uh, at all. It's, it's something that you, you fr frankly would not know your neighbor necessarily has uh, in many of the neighborhoods. So those I are think the we should get to some questions. Go for it. Okay, great. Thank you, Margarita and Tom, and thank you to all our panelists. Um, now we will turn to the questions that were submitted by the attendees when they registered. And the first question will be for Sarah. Sarah, how does the proposed legislation impact home rule? What authority over zoning would Greenwich retain, if any, and what authority does it stand to lose? Great. So thanks for the question. There was actually an op-ed about this in the Connecticut Post uh, and affiliated papers, if anybody saw this, written by a, a Yale law professor uh, who specializes in these issues. But just to summarize, um, Connecticut is not actually a, what we would call a home rule state in state and local government uh, uh, circles. It's called, it's really a Dillon's rule state, which means that local governments uh, only have the powers that they're granted expressly by the state. That's a very simplified version of it. Already, Connecticut has granted uh, towns local government authority. So the proposal would not change that. Um, it's uh, primarily amending the local government authority, um, but uh, in many ways, the bill, and we haven't talked about these provisions, um, but actually adds to the powers of towns to, to do certain things. And again, things that we haven't discussed today, um, but really provides guidance within that, that framework. So it's, it's not what uh, we would typically consider to be an intrusion onto home rule. We're not even a home rule state uh, and impact some of the bill empowers towns. Here's a question for Margarita. What are the specific challenges of creating affordability in high land value communities like Greenwich? Um, it, it's really simple. It doesn't work for the builders. They don't want to do it. And uh, the housing authority has trouble buying more land. So those are the two things. The numbers don't work. So that's why we've been talking about how we will subsidize and assist and finance and uh, we were doing it two ways as Katie mentioned uh, we're revising our regulations so that we give people zoning a much bigger zoning incentive so that they add affordable housing and the other thing we're looking at doing right now is to start the trust uh, we're also looking at a program that lends money to the housing authority thank you thank you um, Melissa what other ways can we increase housing choice apart from reforming zoning laws? So just to add on to what Margarita said, you know, another thing, um, obviously site identification, um, bringing down that cost is critical. So if there are sites that are publicly owned sites, you know, that can be conveyed to developers, um, that's, you know, an opportunity. Also just, you know, something simple, um, which is covered in certain ways um, in the bill, but I think, you know, on a local level could be done is just streamlining the development approvals process. It goes along with, you know, site identification. If there are sites that developers know the town wants to see developed for affordable housing, and if the process itself, you know, is streamlined, that, that time that's taken in public hearings that maybe aren't as efficient as they could be. So obviously, you know, agreed that the public hearing process is an important part of the process, but I think you know, for folks who've sat through hours and hours of hearings over months and sometimes years, you know, that could be a streamlined process, even sort of internal to towns and not to speak to Greenwich's process in particular, because I'm not, you know, familiar on the ground, but just, you know, a one-stop shop where a developer can come in and move through the process sort of facilitated, all of those things can bring down um, development costs. And then I say, you know, one other thing, maybe on some production incentives, in addition to the density bonuses, you can look at things like property tax abatements or phase-ins that incentivize affordable housing development um, and, you know, sort of the whole suite of things together, you know, but it's a challenge. Obviously, the high cost of housing is the big challenge. So I think you have to really attack it from multiple angles. It's not a one, you know, one solution is going to solve it. Here's a question for Katie. If developers are permitted to build multifamily units around our main train station, with reduced parking requirements, wouldn't that negatively impact small businesses who need the existing parking spaces for customers? 
and won't it also lead to traffic congestion? Well, um, you know, generally speaking, I think when you when you try to bring in affordable housing into an area and it's and housing just generally around train stations, you get you get less um, congestion and you have less people that will want to drive because there'll be more affordable housing. However, um, speaking specifically to Greenwich, I think it actually would be a problem. As you heard Sarah note, there's been a 50% decrease in the population in the downtown over the last 40 years. And the reason partly um, as Margarita noted is that you have uh, people coming in and buying what have been five unit buildings and creating you know two unit luxury buildings and i'm sure there's a lot of realtors on this on this call and, and you all know better than the rest of us that the downtown is very popular um in at the moment and people want to quote downsize into the downtown and so um i don't think that i think we will actually have more um a parking problem even though i think it sort of bucks the trend just because of the way that that things um operate in greenwich and i and also the, along those lines too uh, we had done studies of the amount of parking in our downtown when we were looking to loosen up our liquor regulations and we had found that there is actually parking but the desire to park in front of the store you're going to outweighs the the desire to get there in a timely fashion without having to drive around Greenwich Avenue five times so <laughs> we all know that too well great uh, I'd just like to interrupt for a second um it is two o'clock um, we are going to extend for another 10 minutes. We have a hard stop at 2.15, but um, we'll get through as many questions as possible now in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So thank you all. I just got a text that the bill moved favorably out of the committee. Is that correct, Sarah? Yes, I believe it did. So the bill moved out favorably from committee uh, with section with the changes that we have this morning. Great. Sarah, this question is for you. How will these proposals impact our existing home values, especially if the aim is to increase housing supply and affordability? Yeah, this is a great question that we've heard. Um, it's actually, and I'll put a link in the chat uh, on our FAQs page. Uh, we have a link to a number of studies from many other states that show um, that uh, things like ADUs, accessory dwelling units, can significantly increase the value of a single family home that invests in creating one. Uh, even two to four family unit uh, dwellings can also increase the value of single family housing uh, in the overall neighborhood because of the uh, diversity that it brings and also because the neighborhood becomes more attractive. So I'll put links to those studies in the, in the chat, but uh, far from affecting single family home values, particularly uh, in Greenwich, where the only real change on the uh, for a single family neighborhood is actually empowering uh, individual homeowners to build an ADU. These proposals will have a significant positive benefit on single family homeowners in Greenwich. Okay, let's go to some live questions. Nancy? Sure. Okay. Um, here's one. Since other cities move to quote desegregate by zoning ha um, have not worked, why try it here? For example, AHU have been around for over half a decade in, in um, Minneapolis and only saw 0.02% units built since 2014. In Greenwich, that would imply 48 such units in town. Hence, what is the real reason behind, behind this? Um, since affordable housing does not seem to be the outcome. Who wants to answer that? That sounds like a Sarah question. And actually, Melissa has done a major study on accessory dwelling units um, as well and through region, the Regional Plan Association. She may wish to chime in. But so that's a great question again. So th there are similar issues. Um, California has legalized accessory dwelling units statewide. and. It, many cities, including Los Angeles and San Diego, had had accessory dwelling units uh, in the past. In San Diego, before the California law, the state law was significantly um, adopted. I think they, the number is they were producing nine units of housing per year, um, nine units of ADUs per year. After the law was passed, they're now up to, as of last year, 386 units of new ADUs permitted that year. Um, similarly, in Los Angeles, 
the number of units ADUs increased 11 fold after the state law passed. And the reason for that is that it, it provides people with uh, assurance, it provides a little bit of publicity to the idea that you can do this in your homes, um, but it gives people much clearer rules about how to, how to do that. And that's what we're hoping happens here. And we hope that that um, is enabled. I think the, the statistics for Greenwich and Katie and Margarita can correct me if I'm wrong, but even though the ADU has been on the books for uh, many decades, I think maybe it's 100 units that have been produced. Yeah. yeah. 70, you said? No, 100, yeah. You did your homework. Yep. Okay, yep. so 100 yep. units, and, and, and that's, that's great, but it's certainly not, not a lot compared to the capacity um, that Greenwich has for these kinds of housing. So Melissa, did you have some other Sure. I mean, I guess, you know, another piece of it obviously is is making it um, easy and practical for the homeowner, right? So I think one point, um, you know, in terms of sort of an earlier comment, it's not like you're going to see a deluge of ADUs just because they're enabled, you know, providing technical assistance and also financing is a big piece of it too. It, it, it costs money to actually make that happen. So there's, you know, different things that local communities can do to, in addition to zoning for zoning, I think of as the first step, you know, enabling something through land use and then seeing what the other barriers, you know, may be to people actually executing on it and then addressing those things too. Why did Greenwich keep its ADU elderly only provision when updating its zoning code in 2020? Why does PNC not want young people living in an ADU unless it is deed restricted affordable? Katie, you or me? Go ahead, I'm happy to answer. Um, we we felt that there was a significant need, a societal need for the senior population uh, for aging in place, and we thought we'd retain it to fill that need. Uh, but we are open. We're already talking about following what Sarah's suggesting, regardless. So that we didn't know the bill was going to move out of committee. Uh, we're already working on revising the regulations, so we will take out the age and affordability restriction. Uh, I, I hate to give up the affordability because I don't think we're going to get any otherwise, but it does serve a societal need to have it wide open. So let's do it. And, and they are based on the area medium income, which is, as you saw in Melissa's presentation, is much higher than the state medium income. So it, it is designed to attract the young people. So it's the, it's the affordable component attracts the young people and the elderly is obviously for the elderly. So I think it does actually cover both. Um, removing the restriction obviously would make it available to everybody, which is a positive. Um, the, the main restriction I think we should get rid of is um, that the units have had to be in, in the housing structure has to be in place for the last five years. I don't see the value in that. The, the concern initially was that there would be two family housing all over the community. Um, and that hasn't come to, to, to fruition as Sarah noted, there's only a hundred. So I think we could do a lot better. And, um, and I think we should. Okay, the next question is about impact on our elementary schools, our public elementary schools. The question is, there is no discussion on how this affects the public elementary schools, as it is the elementary schools in this proposed area are already the most socioeconomically diverse and thus receive lower scores compared to other schools. There needs to be more focus on other areas of town. Who would like to take that? May I, may I take that one? Um, yes. I think just, just in that small area that I showed on my maps, um, I don't imagine that the people that will be coming into the, the nine or less um, a, a units that would be constructed, assuming that's the way it goes, I believe that they will be mostly very high-end luxury. And what we see is there's not a lot of children that come in with um, in, into those units. At least that's, that's what we've seen. And interestingly, um, even though we do want to have affordable units and moderate income units um, as you know, and the, and the moderate income is designed for the Greenwich workforce. Interestingly, what we found is that there's not a lot of children that actually are in those units, even when we have two bedroom or more. Um, they tend to be for single people or for, or for couples. So that's just part of the Greenwich dynamic, again, which is, it's, you know, very Greenwich specific, I think, because I don't think you find that elsewhere. Having said that, um, if we were to to get miraculously our, our 4,000 units under the set aside development rules of of 830G and ended up with 10,000 more people, obviously that would be an impact whether they're children or not. Um, obviously some of them would be. So that that would be um, a concern, but 
we've had the 830G for 40 years and we don't have very many of those types of developments as you saw on some of our maps. So with the land prices the way they are, that's why we're looking at different ways to increase affordability outside of those provisions, which don't add too much. Here's a question for Margarita. Has anyone offered to fund the housing trust fund? Yes. Are they didn't say how much. <laughs> they didn't say how much, but we've got we've got people who say that if we had a housing trust fund, that's uh, we said okay, that makes sense. Great. And we'll okay. take more. Anything you can give us. <laughs> Okay, consensus is that adding affordable housing in Greenwich reduces traffic congestion on I-95, but does it also reduce traffic congestion within Greenwich? I saw Peter Berg was asking that question. Um, it's a tricky question. It really comes down to, and you guys weigh in, It it, it depends who you're serving with your affordable housing. Are they already working in town? Were they living outside of town and commuting in? You know, it's very tricky to know. We have been pleased to see units go up by the elementary schools because that allows teachers to walk to work, for example, would reduce traffic. But on the other hand, I, it, 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 I don't know, there is data that the greater affordability reduces reduces transit, but uh, it it can be situationally specific. Sarah, do you wanna add anything to that? I know you've, you've shared the studies about what happens. Yeah, so I mean, in general, our, the studies show that if you tend to build walkable communities, more people will walk. Um, and so if you put more housing and again, not all of Greenwich would, would be zoned this way whatsoever, but in these less than 1% of the state that we're hoping to affect with what was section six, um, it would be creating, the, the, the impetus would be to create walkable communities that get cars off the road. So that does, you know, whether those people are walking to the Greenwich pharmacy as opposed to driving to um, a CVS on the post road kind of thing, you're, you're creating opportunities for people to choose to be able to walk instead of drive. Um, so that's really the environmental, I, I view that as the environmental component of our bill. Um, but of course, walk, walkable communities are much more attractive to uh, a, a much broader range of people. You see millennials these days who don't want cars at all. They don't even get driver's licenses. So, mm. so doing that is really the smart thing to do it's, uh, economically because that's where the demand is going. And, and as you saw from my first map, that's not what Connecticut is building. Um, it's also the environmentally smart thing to do because it's, it's allowing for walkable communities for people who choose to live there, knowing that we have a very large um, a, a building stock for people who, who prefer to live in the single family detached housing. If Greenwich's downtown population dropped by 50% since 1960, why has Greenwich consistently decreased the allowable density in that area and along Putnam Avenue? Um, we answered that question earlier. We got rid of the R6, of, of R6 multifamily on Millbank because it was the reason the population dropped. We went from having multifamily units to the luxury townhomes you all know on Millbank Avenue. And it, I, in retrospect, could we have crafted the regulation differently? Sure, we could have done inclusionary zoning back then, but we didn't think of that. So that's the problem. That's why it was dropping because you were getting expensive stuff that cost $5 million instead of those old houses. And that's but, why we, go ahead, Katie. We, we simultaneously though did um, increase within the business zones, the amount of density that you could have in those areas for, um, for either mixed use or for, for solely residential. So that was, that was an option. Um, and if you had that increased density, then you were required to have below market rate units. So that's the, our version of inclusionary zoning pre the moratorium. Great. Okay, this question is specifically for Margarita and Katie. And, and also Nancy, just to interrupt, sorry, it has to be the last question also. Thank you, thank you, Aya. Last question. A new bill was passed by the Transportation Committee inviting towns to look to state-owned land as part of their 830 affordability plans. Could this be helpful in Greenwich? 
We are so excited about that bill. It is so fantastic because it takes it 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 looks at state-owned property by the train stations and it asks where our municipal property is, the state. Um, it, we happen to talk among all the Fairfield County communities. And one of the towns has been negotiating with the state for a year to get some land from the state for affordable. This would go bingo, we'd be able to access it and without a huge, a huge negotiation. So we're excited about being able to build on state land. Anybody else has comments on that quickly? I know we're out of time, but um, Sarah doesn't look excited. We'll take any land we can here to do affordable housing. Oh no, no, I, I, I was, I was smiling. No, I, I think it's you know, there's so many bills that are coming through the legislature right now. It's a big opportunity for Connecticut to do better and to learn best practices from the communities that are trying. And I would put Greenwich in that category um, that are trying to do better and to to not you know to to kind of. And I hope going forward, now that we're seeing the bills as they are kind of set, sh shuffling out of the committees, um, to continue that conversation and to continue the dialogue and to do it in a way, uh, just like today, that's that's respectful, that's fact based, and um, that recognizes differences of opinions on how to get there. But that we all know we need to do something more, and um, there's a lot of smart ideas out there. So, so, um, so yeah, I, I know you're, I, you're, I know you're on the hard stuff. But Katie and I were already searching hard. We've been searching for months to find municipal and state-owned property that we could use. We talk to the, to the town properties committee all the time and we're, we're always asking, so where could we do some affordable housing? So to us, it's exciting. It is. It is this has been really a, a very fascinating and interesting discussion. I learned a lot personally, and I thank all of our presenters for all the information and the research and, and sharing their views and uh, the information that, that was provided today. I want to thank all of you for attending. We had a, a very, very good attendance, just under 300, not quite the 400 plus that we had registered, but still a record for the League of Women Voters of Greenwich particularly for a lunchtime event. So thank you to our presenters for an amazing and interesting discussion. Thank you for all of you, our members and non-members for participating. Uh, we, we can't do this without you. And remember, you can always visit our website to sign up to become a member for our member only events, as well as our community events. And also if you miss anything, we love that you would go and visit our YouTube channel or our website to see what interesting information you can learn to help participate in your local democracy. So thank you, everybody. Another fantastic event by the League of Women Voters of Greenwich for a fantastic town. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.